So the webinar series schedule moving forward is that um, for day one, today, we'll be talking about outfall design considerations and regulations. And uh, on day two, we'll be talking about thermal discharge specifically, and on day three, non-thermal discharge. So if we look at uh, the, 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 today's webinar on uh, outfall design considerations and regulations and move forward with the agenda, we'll be starting with um, two people from Malcolm Perney that I'll introduce in a moment. Um, design considerations for uh, this introduction to outfalls and discharges will be given by Hagop Shahabian and regulatory considerations by Anthony Russo. And then we'll have an introduction to numerical modeling given by Dan Gessler at Alden. And Hagop will then come back and summarize. So as I mentioned, the first speaker today will be Hagop Shahabian. He'll be working with Anthony Russo. Um, they're both at Malcolm Perney. And I'll introduce them both right now. Uh, first, Dr. Hagop Shahabian is a senior associate with Malcolm Perney. He specializes in solving hydrologic and hydraulic problems. Over his 30-plus year career, he's conducted numerous hydraulic analyses of water and wastewater treatment plants, ranging from two to 1,270 million gallons per day in size. He was instrumental in the development of the Malcolm Perney in-house profile model to perform treatment plant hydraulic evaluations. His work also involves the design of outfall structures, large diameter transmission pipelines, as well as water hammer analyses of tunnels and pumping stations. Anthony Russo is a principal environmental scientist and ecologist with Arcadis and Perney, and his experience encompasses the full scope of project organization and delivery, including technical, managerial, and financial aspects. With his breadth of experience, he's completed numerous domestic and international projects, varying in both scale and complexity. He specializes in environmental impact assessments, ecology, scientific investigations, and feasibility studies, due diligence inquiries, siting studies, policy and planning, regulatory compliance, and ecosystem restoration. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Hagop. Um, Hagop, do you and, and Tony have control of the slides? Uh, I'm not sure. If you have them up in front of you, you should be able to just click on the down arrow to move forward. Do not have control, David. Do you want to? Sure, I'll I'll take care of it, and okay. uh, and and scroll down for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to start with, just a word about Mark and Perny. Uh, we are one of the largest U.S. firms focused just on environmental and water issues. We've been in the business over a hundred years, uh, with over five thousand private clients. We provide environmental engineering, science, and consulting services. And we have a staff of about 1,600 over, on over 60 offices. As of July 2009, just about a year ago, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Arcadis. Next, please. Uh, just to reiterate the outline of today's talk, I'm going to be talking about outfall basics and design and construction, and then Tony Russo is going to be covering the planning and regulatory compliance of outfalls and in general. Uh, next, please. We're really starting from basics with the definition, what is an outfall? In my definition, an outfall is a man-made outlet that discharges wastewater into a larger body of water. By this definition, the outfall can be anything from stormwater outlet, a treated effluent from a wastewater plant, a thermal discharge, a brine discharge from desalination plant. So anything that is man-made and is discharging into a larger body of water is defined as an outfall. Next, please. However, for the purpose of this webinar, uh, 
I'm defining the odd fold as an outlet that requires an MPDS permit. In other words, a permit to discharge. And as a consequence of that, it has to satisfy the water quality standards of the receiving water that is being discharged through that outlet. And also for this webinar, I'm defining the outfall as an outfall which is equipped with a diffuser that can provide additional dilutions. So with those ground rules in mind, let's go ahead. Next one, please. What is the function of an outfall? Properly designed artful diffuser system can be considered as an added process to help achieve compliance with the NPDES requirements by providing additional dilutions. Uh, what do we mean by that? It, 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 it can help us achieve the NPDES requirements for toxicity, for excess temperature, for brine, for heavy metals, or any other constituents that conventional treatment in a wastewater or in a, in, a, in a power plant where we have excess temperature could not be eliminated. So this basically is providing a means of achieving that and therefore can be viewed as an added process. Next, please. So what is the process by which we are complying with it? The outfall and added process. An outfall is provided with a the zone of initial dilution, or some people call it initial mixing zone. That Z, or the zone of initial dilution, is where rapid dilution of the discharge plume occurs due to both effects of buoyancy and momentum. That the, the water quality standards in that Z could be in excess of the ambient water quality standards. In other words, the, the regulatory agency provides you that as a playing field. You can, you can exceed the standards in that particular box. However, you have to meet them at the edge of the mixing zone. So therefore, the dilutions that you achieve in the Z are credited to the MTDES. Next, please. Let me give you an example. Suppose we have a wastewater discharging 10 MGD into a river. Uh, the river has a minimum discharge of 100 MGD. However, we want to define that minimum. Some regulatory agencies consider that at 7Q2 or 7Q10, which is the seven day, a minimum seven day with, uh, flow with the two year frequency or for the 7Q10, which would be the minimum seven day flow over 10 days. So the minimum river discharge in this particular example is 100 MGD. Therefore, if you were to consider those two flows, the maximum dilution attainable is going to be 11. Now, 11 is the theoretical maximum that you can achieve. Uh, however, in the Z, you could go somewhere between 6 and 7. Uh, 6 and 7 might not be that much, however, uh, 6 and 7 dilutions might get you away with the toxicity issue and some of the other parameters. Now, uh, you could be able to get much, uh, much more dilutions if you are in a larger body of water, such as an estuary or a large lake or an open ocean. Next, please. So, just touched about as to what the receiving waters might be. The receiving waters can be anything like a river, a lake, an estuary, or the ocean. In each case, the physical, chemical, biological characteristics will determine the assimilative capacity potentials relative to the effluent. What do we mean by that? The physical characteristic is, for, for example, the flow in a river, its width, its depth, the velocity, uh, the background concentrations, the same applies for an ocean, it will be how deep the waters are, what type of currents you are experiencing at the points of discharge, what are the background concentrations, what are the biological properties of, of the particular river or, or receiving water that you are dealing with. So all these 
get into the design and, uh, and, and work of the uh, art form and the fuses. Next, please. So let's talk about how do we go about designing and constructing an art form from soup to nuts, from the very early stages all the way to the construction and the permitting of it. Next, please. We, in general, consider that you have five stages or five phases in the not for construction. The studies, the design, the regulatory and the permitting issues, the construction, and finally the testing and the validation of the art form. All these are not consecutive, but they are normally or regularly work in parallel. In other words, you have studies and design uh, kind of working in parallel. You need to incorporate the regulatory requirements into it. So, so therefore, all, the first three are really uh, work in progress, and they have interactions between them, and we shall see that. Next, please. Let's go over the studies. The first set of studies are what I consider preliminary studies, where you take a topographic map and a bathymetric map and look at them and say, okay, where am I going to discharge this effluent to? So with that, you might want to guess about two or three locations. You look around to see if there are any sensitive areas there that you can identify from bathymetric map or from known other locations. You look at the water body and see what type of flows you have, what are the quality standards that you need to achieve. You look at the discharge from a wastewater treatment plant and see what constituents are exceeding the water quality standards and they need to be incorporated in the outflow design. So with that, that will give you some idea as to what type of dilutions you might require. And part of the preliminary studies is to see what data is not available, and you would like to collect it in the field. That's where we design a reconnaissance program. Now imagine that this is not a terrestrial uh, project, but it's underwater, so, so you won't be able to see anything. So, so you need to collect data to be able to achieve some familiarity with the point of discharge and the route that you're going to be taking to get there. Next, please. So the reconnaissance is the gathering of limited information to conduct an initial phase of flow analysis. What type of data do we collect? We collect bathymetric information along the routes of interest that we identified earlier. We do some sonar, seismic, and ROVs, the first two to be able to determine what type of soils and uh, that we, uh, physical characteristics of the soils and what we have there. Uh, some CTDs, which stand for uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, depth. And that will provide you with the, uh, what are the density variations in the water column. Maybe some currents to understand what flows are like and what velocities you're, you're dealing with. If the parameters of interest include metals, some water quality sampling using key techniques will be of particularly advantageous because that allows you to go to lower uh, detection limits in the receiving water, which would be uh, helping you in achieving water quality standards. I want to take some sediment samples for physical, biological, and chemical analysis. If you want to get rid of them to see what you, where you can put it, uh, to understand if the, the soils are, are gravelly or sand or clay or whatever, I guess. So, so you need to have that information. And you might want to do a few borings, limited amount of borings along the routes of interest uh, to get an idea as to what you're dealing with. So with the data that in, in hand, this data in hand, next please, you conduct a fatal flow analysis. Next, uh, previous one, please. Uh, the phase of flow analysis is the early analysis and an identification of potential road, roadblocks of the project. You might have engineering challenges such as a very steep slopes where you cannot build an art form. Uh, 
Or you might have a sunken shed, which might be, first of all, an obstruction, or might have historical significance. So that area needs to be avoided. You might have some biological sensitive areas, like coral reefs or endangered species, like the manatees that we're showing and some of the corals over there. Uh, next, please. Once you are sure that you are going to ultimately be able to build this or overcome the obstacles that are there, you would like to start doing some initial analysis. One of the more important ones is a mixing zone analysis. What that involves is basically trying to see what is it going to take to be able to achieve the water quality standards that you have set up to do. So what are the required how are we going to achieve the required dilutions? What geometry are we going to provide the diffuser? Is it going to be in line? In other words, the outfall is going to have a few pores that will be discharging the effluent along those the center line of the outfall, or is it going to be a T or a Y connection? What size does the diffuser and the outfall need to be? What size would the ports be? What are the dimensions of the mixing zone? These other things to consider in the design of a of an outfall and mixing zone is that if you have multi-port discharges, that each port discharges the same amount of flow, uh, that will ensure that you are not going to have any ports which are not discharging under different flow conditions. Or sometimes they might reverse the direction of the flow and start sucking it water from the ambient water into the outfall as opposed to discharging from the outfall to the receiving waters. If that were to happen, you might be incorporating or bringing in some sediments into the diffuser and outfall and then blocking it. So, so you'd like to be able to avoid that. And also, if at all possible, surfacing of the plumes. You do not want to have the plumes be visible from the surface uh, for a couple of things, for aesthetics, if it's a wastewater discharge, you might have an, uh, odor issues. So you would like to keep the plume submerged and underwater as much as possible. Next, please. After the near field analysis, which was the mixing zone, uh, depending on the conditions, you might want to conduct a far field analysis, which would be what is happening to the waste field? What is the fate and transport? What, what we are discharging from the Z, where is it going to end up? You might need to have a hydrodynamic and water quality modeling for the purpose, and we're going to cover that with Dan Gessler later on in this program. Next, please. Next. There would be some additional studies uh, involving hydraulic studies uh, to understand if the outfall that you're designing is going to be uh, working by gravity or you would need to have a pumping system associated with it. And if you were to have a pumping system, you might want to provide uh, do transit analysis for power failure or startup. You probably would need to have a wave, a wave force studies in the oceans and lakes look at the outfall stability, how much cover to provide, what method of construction you're going to have uh, for the outfall. Next, please. For these studies and uh, for the design, you might need to have additional data collection in the field. For the construction, uh, you would like to have some detailed bathymetry Borings, additional borings along the route that you finally selected. Sediment sampling, again, for chemical and, bi uh, and biological analysis. Additional water quality sampling. Uh, some fish sampling. So, so this data collection is to provide for the needs of the engineering and also for the regulatory requirements that Tony is going to be talking about. Next, please. In general, the regulatory requirements would, would have some environmental assessment impact, and then construction permits 
uh, like the U.S. Coffee, Genius, for one, uh, and the U.S. Court Scout would be involved, Fish and Wildlife State, Historic Preservation Office, and then ultimately you would need operation permits to be able to operate this. We'll cover that at the late, late, uh, next stages of these presentations. So now that we have taken supposedly care of the regulatory requirements, let's, uh, next please. How do you go about the design of the art form? Obviously, you have the preliminary design where you have to, to look at the foundation and select what type of uh, foundation to have. Is it going to be on piles? Is it going to be buried? Is it going to be on the surface? What material are you going to be used? It can be steel, it can be reinforced concrete, or it could be HDPE. Uh, the methods of construction, how are you going to build this? Some cost estimates associated with that. And then the final design would involve the final drawings, final specifications, and final cost estimates. Uh, the picture that you're seeing over there is a working orifice from a deep outfall that, uh, that is discharging some effluent over there. Next, please. <coughs> What are the phases for now for construction? It is a good idea for the design, for, for the construction of the output to pre-qualify the contractors and not just open the bids for everybody. Because this is a, a very specialized field and so, so therefore the pre-qualification becomes important. After the pre-qualifications, you have, you go through the normal process of bid selection. Uh, contract negotiation and notice to proceed. And then you would have the construction activities, which we're seeing there. You know, some of, some of them are being built on barges. Some sometimes they use a deep diving, like you have in the upper pictures. I have it. Those, those guys would be working there at the depth of over 300 feet, and uh, be there for seven or eight hours. And uh, you would have some regulatory constraints during the outboard constructions that you need to take care of. And then finally, there would be the final testing of the physical uh, disposition of the outboard, final inspection and acceptance. Next, please. Sometimes for the outboard, there might be post construction validation uh, because of regulations. So for that, uh, you would do some dye studies to validate the mixing zone. You need to modify the permit because you have put something new that is going to allow you to discharge uh, at a higher concentration while still maintaining or meeting the water quality standards. And <clears throat> there might be other concerns uh, that we'll talk about uh, on Thursday about post-construction monitoring. Next, please. Now, I'd like to bring in Tony Russo, who's going to be talking about the planning and regulatory compliance. Tony and I have worked together for over 20 years uh, on different projects, and he's been taking care of the planning and regulatory concerns of a variety of projects. Tony? Okay, thanks, Haga. Um so this part of the uh, of the uh, presentation really deals with, uh, in a broad sense, you know, planning the planning necessary to achieve regulatory compliance you know, when faced with construction or significant major reconstruction of a large outfall. And the way that we've structured this talk today is to have it really be able to pertain to any kind of an outfall, whether it's for discharging uh, wastewater from a sewage treatment plant some of what Hagap just talked about, whether it's industrial effluent or thermal effluent, regardless of the type of outfall, but the, really that the planning and the permitting process and some of the basic things you need to do are, uh, you know, are, uh, are consistent. And you'll hear more about that as we, as we go through with the other, with the other presenters. Uh, next slide. So pretty basic here is, you know, what, what do we mean by regulatory compliance? And essentially, is what you have here. It means that you've got to fulfill all the all the necessary requirements, including any kind of special conditions that may be in a permit, in order to undertake an action or activity at a, at a site. And if you hit hit the slide uh, here again, 
Uh, that can mean a lot of things. It can mean it can mean a classic permit that you might have for an NP, NPDES permit. It can be an approval that you have to seek from a state agency or a cooperating agency. It could be a certification, like a water quality certificate, but it's the, it's the totality of all of those various things that make up compliance. Next slide. Now, most often, regulatory compliance means having to obtain some form of specific, what I'll call a discretionary permit. By discretionary permit, you mean, we mean that the agency, let's say it's the uh, Corps of Engineers, has the discretion to issue that permit or not. And if they issue that permit, let's say, to condition that permit with other requirements, that's a discretionary permit, and that's, that's the classic type of approval that, uh, that all of us think about. But there's other things as well that, that, that you need to think about that you may need in order to uh, get that main permit, which could include things like approvals from state cooperating agencies, uh, various uh, con uh, uh, consultation reviews that you may have to have with with Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service or, or some other types of group. But there's a whole host of things that you need to be aware of in order to achieve all the compliance for your project, both for construction and then, of course, during, during operation. Next slide. So as you can imagine, you know, getting all the permits for a complex project can be a very, very uh, you know, uh, complex thing to do to say the least, it could be lengthy, it could be expensive to, to, to do. So, so you and your team, you know, really need to be able to plan out and carefully scope an approach that accommodates some of the, a lot of the things that Hagop just talked about. Needs to, you need to be able to accommodate the knowns as well as the unknowns that, uh, that will surface on that, on that project. Uh, so, so your, your, your approach has got to be flexible. And by flexible, we mean that you've got to You've got to adapt it for your particular project, the site, the particulars regarding the discharge, the client perhaps, the state agency or the federal agency that you're working with. Because all the projects are different, all of the discharge uh, locations are, 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 are different. Uh, key to success is early and active consultation and outreach with the various regulatory agencies. Uh, although you may have one main regulatory agency, be it the US EPA or say the, the various state agent that may that may be in a uh, a position of granting or approval for, for, for the project, but you've also got to accommodate the other natural resource trustees and get their input to the process as well as the public. Um, however, and unfortunately, there isn't what I've called here a punch list. There's no universal punch list to to, uh, to follow here. You can't simply take what you did on one project and necessarily apply it to the next one and expect that it's going to work the same way every time because the projects are certainly different and the needs are different. Uh, next slide. So here's a really, really simple concept to illustrate, illustrate this, where you and your team can plan for and scope you know, the range of potential regulatory needs when executing a major outfall project. And it sounds simple enough, but it begins with scoping the project and things that Hagop just talked about in terms of truly understanding both the engineering aspects of the project as well as the as well as uh, uh, the physical and biological environment that you're dealing with. So you understand all of the parameters. You've got to then inventory the affected resources because you may then need to seek special permits or approvals or consultations for those resources. For example, as again, as Hagat mentioned a minute ago, you may be in a case where you're affecting a particular type of uh, uh, endangered species or you're affecting a particular type of commercial or recreational fisheries resource. Well, knowing that will enable you to you know, navigate your regulatory uh, requirements in a, in, a more, in a more complete way. You've got to understand the regulations. You've got to be thinking about alternatives, and by alternatives I mean that you know, there are ways where sometimes when you're planning any of these outfall projects to, to not avoid a permit, and I don't mean that avoid in a, in, a, in a nefarious way, but there could be ways where you could minimize or mitigate the need for having to get a particular type of permit or lessen the type of permit by implementing an alternative 
That could be as simple as, say, avoiding a particular sensitive area or by uh, avoiding construction during a particularly sensitive season. And in the Northeast here, for example, uh, construction, say, during the winter months, uh, there's a concern for affecting, say, winter flounder. And avoiding that winter season for winter flounder, you know, gets you out of some of that uh, some of that, uh, uh, some, some of the issues with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, ultimately, then you end up with a plan, hopefully, and that plan serves as a phone book, if you will, or a directory for you and your team to be able to plan for and navigate the various, you know, the various uh, uh, requirements that you've got to uh, you've got to achieve. With, of course, communication between the engineering team, the modelers, and the the, the, the permitting folks has got to be consistent. Uh, all along so that so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk for a min minute about some of the key regulatory requirements, you know, when you're planning for, again, major construction or reconstruction of an outfall. And bri briefly, these include what, what you see here. You've got comprehensive environmental laws, regulations and policies, natural resources, cultural resources, and socioeconomic resources, okay? By comprehensive environmental laws and policies, we essentially mean here NEPA, or the National Environmental Policy Act, or in cases where there's a state equivalency, say, for example, in New York or California or other states where there's a requirement to prepare, in addition to the permit application, uh, a separate environmental assessment or potentially an environmental impact statement. That's critical to, to know and understand that. Natural resources, key driver here being being endangered species as well as other protected habitats and sanctuaries. Uh, cultural resources, both from an aquatic standpoint and a terrestrial standpoint. We'll talk about these more in a minute. Socioeconomic resources. The only one that I'll mention here and make, make partic particular note of is environmental justice. You know, having to do EJ assessments is now a mandated, mandated uh, step that you've got to go through for any kind of a project that's going to involve a federal approval, in particular federal funding. So all of the federal agencies, if it's EPA or the Corps of Engineers, will have as a requirement the need to undertake an EJ evaluation. And what does that essentially mean? That means a consideration of whether or not your project is going to adversely affect or disproportionately affect a disadvantaged population, economically disadvantaged population, a minority population, Indian tribe, very, very critical. And as you can imagine, with respect to a discharge, citing a discharge to, to release some kind of effluent uh, in, in one of those types of areas is of, is of particular concern for these, for these agencies. Uh, next slide. Another simple, simple graphic which is really meant to simply illustrate the interrelationship of major components or tasks associated with advancing a major outfall project. And again, some of the things that Hogup just mentioned, you'll see here where you're doing design. We've got to uh, do supporting studies and analyses for geophysical, for water quality. Um, you've got to do all of these various things in planning your project. Uh, but rather than you know, looking at the steps for compliance, as what I'll say as a waterfall progression, meaning you know one step leading directly into another in a stop and start fashion. It never is that way. It never works that way. Rather, it's this sort of interrelationship of these tasks with one building off the other. And oftentimes, you're starting on, on many of these tasks somewhat at the same time and advancing them along what may be independent yet parallel paths. Why? Because the output of one feeds into another. For example, you know, some of the studies that Hagat mentioned a minute ago, the supporting studies and analyses, you need to know and understand that from a constructability standpoint and an operational standpoint. Um, and where does that information go? Well, it goes into your draft permit applications. It goes into your, it feeds back into your design. Your design ultimately feeds into your EA or your EIS. So all of those things, all of those things really play, play together. And of course, public outreach and, and stakeholder consultations are something that really is needs to begin very, very early in the process, and it continues really throughout. And that's where you're getting feedback from the public, from involved agencies, or from interested agencies or groups that are going to have 
potentially uh, 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 you know comment or or say on your project. Next slide. So let's just talk about some of the some of these regulations in a little bit more detail. Uh, at least the key ones, anyway. Uh, the first one I mentioned earlier, and that is NEPA, or what else? What I'll call NEPA state equivalence equivalencies. And by that we mean the need to potentially prepare an environmental assessment or impact statement. And of course, NEPA goes back to you know 1969, but there are again, of course, uh, uh, some state equivalencies here that you need to be concerned with in, in, in certain states. Having to do an EA or an EIS, again, can be, can be lengthy, can be costly, and it's, it's a whole other set of requirements that you have to go through above and beyond you know, your classic permits, because, because your EA or your EIS is not a permit, but it's instead it's a review document or a decision document wherein you're providing the public and the regulatory agencies with information regarding your project as well as alternatives so that they can consider the impacts of the discharge. Uh, typical triggers for NEPA would be if, for example, your particular outfall project required a permit from the Corps of Engineers. There are times when having to get a Section 10 404 permit from the Corps may necessitate its own separate EIS or EA as a result of the Corps' Uh, 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 pr process. Another example would be if you're working on, say, a power project and your project and, and 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 the client is say soliciting federal funds under say FERC. Well, that would get you into a NEPA uh, situation because FERC, as a federal agency, would need to evaluate the impacts of the project as a result of their they're potentially issuing or appropriating funds for that project. So there are a few ways where NEPA can potentially kick in to, uh, to uh, your particular project. Uh, next slide. I mentioned this a minute ago, cultural and socioeconomic resources. So by this we mean you know, Section 106 of the, of the Historic Preservation Act. And essentially here you are talking about land resources or terrestrial resources, be they uh, historic buildings or landmarks, areas of statewide significance, Native American sites, and of course on the marine side, things that we've experienced before would be, uh, in particular, uh, shipwrecks, but they could also be formally uh, exposed terrestrial sites that are now flooded, of course. Uh, next slide. Natural resources are perhaps the largest category of, of, uh, of say, permits or compliance that you have to, you have to be aware of. Uh, certainly they involve the, more, the most varied of uh, state and federal agencies. And these, of course, include biological resources, uh, species habitats, significant coastal resources. Uh, the main ones here, uh, Section 10 and Section 404, usually is a permit that uh, is required for any kind of an outfall project, whether it's a new construction or major reconstruction. Uh, essentially regulates the work in the waterway as well as the placement of dredge or fill material into the waterway. And that's a permit that, that, uh, that of course, the Corps of Engineers under the Clean Water Act uh, is responsible for. Uh, Endangered Species Act, another critical one, where, wherein you've got to seek, uh, uh, seek information from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, consult with them on whether or not the project is going to potentially impact and endangered species, their habitat, and so forth. And of course, the Corps of Engineers, you know, will not say proceed with your permit until the until the uh, Endangered Species Act information is uh, you know is taken care of. So those are critical things to get done, you know, early on. Next slide. Some other ones here I won't go through: the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Migratory Birds, Coastal Zone Management Act. I'll mention that one in just in a little bit more detail. The CZMA is administered by usually individual states, and it consists of typically various coastal zone policies which prescribe the types of activities that can occur in the coastal zone. With any you know, state coastal zone management program, you know, the goal is to balance the impacts of whatever the activity is, in this case an outfall and its discharge, on the human and biological uses you know, of that coastal zone. Uh, 
getting the Coastal Zone Management Act consistency, again, is a critical, and sometimes it's an often overlooked step in, in, in projects, but it's critical because, for example, the Corps of Engineers won't go forward with your uh, permit for construction or your permit for operation absent getting consistency by the state that your project is consistent with or is not consistent with the the established coastal zone policy. So that is a very, very important one to be aware of and to, and to bring to the front of your project. Next one. And last, um, I'll just skip down to the, to, to, to the bottom two here. You know, for everybody really today, probably the most important uh, 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 federal requirement here is the Clean Water Act, and it's the key overarching federal law governing both point and non-point sources of pollution into into any kind of a waterway, um, and, and of course, by by discharge here, it's any kind of a pollutant, which can be a chemical pollutant, a thermal, and you're going to hear about more about thermal in, in, in some of the other sessions. But in addition, discharge and pollutant in this case also means dredge or fill material. So hence the Corps of Engineers. Uh, so Clean Water Act, of course, is critical, and then with any outfall, ultimately your goal is that you want to seek your NPDES permit for whatever effluent it is that you're that you're discharging. And you'll hear about more of that uh, in some of the other sessions here regarding uh, thermal discharges and, and industrial discharges. And I think that's the last uh, slide here. Next up is uh, Dan, Dan Gessler of, uh, of Alton. Okay, thanks, Tony and uh, Hagap. I really appreciate your talk. I'm sure everybody else did, too. I'm now going to move right on to Dr. Dan Gessler, who's an Alden principal and has his Ph.D. in civil engineering and hydraulics from Colorado State University. After completing his Ph.D. in 1995, he spent seven years at Colorado State as a research scientist before joining Alden in 2002. At Alden, he served as the director of numeric modeling in the Massachusetts office, and was the director for Colorado operations in the new Colorado office in 2008 before becoming principal in 2009. Dan's going to be talking to us and giving us an introduction to numerical modeling. Dan? The, the aspect that I'm going to be talking about is, is what happens with the effluent after it is discharged and how can we predict where it's going to move. So um, I'd like to start by giving you a brief introduction to Alden and then try to put what we do today into a historical context as to how plume movement um, was modeled or predicted in the past. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how numeric modeling works uh, and some of the models that we use now. So to start with Alden, Alden's the oldest hydraulics lab in the United States, and we have five areas of specialization, and a lot of them touch on, on um, plume aspects. So the first one is the uh, flow meter calibration, um, and then the next one is environmental services, and they specialize particularly in uh, fish exclusion from power plants and then discharges as well, and, and what happens with the plume. Uh, gas flow engineering, they primarily look at, uh, I guess, plumes that are in air, so the discharge and, and cleaning up um, emissions from fossil fuel plants. We have a field services group, and they basically provide a lot of the input that we need for the modeling of plumes. And then uh, hydraulic and hydrodynamic modeling, and, and we basically look at the modeling of the flow field itself. So historically, in the, in the 1970s about, we start to see the first generation of discharge models. And I'll talk more about those, but these are basically one-dimensional analytical models. And those models were good at looking at near-field effects. And so they were supplemented, supplemented with physical models, and those were really primarily for looking at, at far-field effects. So the 1D models um, don't necessarily include all of the flow field effects that are site-specific, but then the physical model that handles the far field can include that. These are fruit scale models. And early on, these were very frequently distorted scale models, so they would have a different vertical and horizontal scale. And that makes sense if you think about it for a moment, um, in that if you're trying to model a very large domain, and maybe you model that at a 1 to 100 scale, 
at a 100 scale, your depth of flow, if the prototype is 10 feet, and the model is only one inch. And so we run into a problem there where in the model, the, the boundary effects from the, from the bed of the model are far more important than they are in the real world. So to overcome that one distorts the model, um, and that introduces a, a new set of issues, uh, and those those issues related with distorted scale models, um, we later found were, were really probably inadequate or resulted in models that are inadequate for looking at near field flow problems. So what was frequently done was that you would combine a distorted scale model for the far field with an undistorted model for the near field. And then from there, we really move into the, the era of the numeric models. Um, and those kind of became viable in the, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. And they're generally less expensive to run than a physical model. And it's numeric models that have largely replaced the use of distorted physical models. So it would be very rare today that you'd see anybody using a distorted scale physical model. It would be more likely that you would see a numeric model used for that. So let's back up then and talk just for a moment about the analytical and the empirical models and what we're talking about there. These are the analytical models are, are based upon either a Gaussian plume growth or empirical spreading data. So we could go, for example, to a flume and put in a pipe and we could inject an effluent there and we can see how that, that plume spreads. Uh, and we can build on that and come up with some empirical relationships. And then we can plug those relationships perhaps into a, a computer program where we can input some boundary conditions and it would give us an idea of how that plume is going to grow or spread. And an example of a code that does that would be Cormix. And uh, these codes are, are accepted by many regulatory agencies for basic near-field diffusion studies. A model like this, though, because of what it's based on, is not going to take into account 3D current variations or local bathymetry. So it basically knows very little about the local conditions other than what you tell it that the conditions are near the effluent. So it's usually not an approach that's used uh, for far field modeling. So for a far field model, we can use CFD or, or a hydrodynamic model, and this is really an inter introduction, I think, to what's coming uh, tomorrow, we can take the entire domain that we're interested in, and we can discretize that into small computational cells. The picture on the right that you're seeing shows a computational mesh that's applied to a small portion of a domain, so you can see how small that the cells are. And on that domain, then, we can calculate the flow field in three dimensions. So we can see flow separations, we can see eddies, we can see vortices that form, and we'll know how that the plume is going to interact with those vortices and how it's going to be transported. Now, even, even with a sophisticated model, um, there's some things or physics that have to be parameterized. Uh, those include, for example, turbulence. Uh, Waves in the larger scale models, you, you don't resolve every single wave. Surface roughness, we're not going to resolve every single rock on the riverbed. That's just characterized as a, as a general roughness and, and so on. If we're going to use a more sophisticated model like this, then we need to know quite a bit about the boundary conditions. And the results of the model aren't going to be any better than what our input is or our boundary conditions that we that we specify. So the things that we need to know here, for example, would include the velocity at the model boundary. We need to know something about the temperature of the water at the boundary. In particular, if it's stratified, we'll want to in input, for example, a vertical temperature profile. Uh, same thing holds true for salinity. So we'll need to know how the salinity varies with depth and how it relates to the salinity or the temperature of the effluent. And then we need to know something about the bathymetry. Uh, we don't want to just model a box. We'd like to model to get the correct flow field. We need to have the correct bathymetry out there. So after we've built the model, um, we've put in our boundary conditions. We've 
probably went to the field first to collect it. We, we, we have the data. We're ready to put it into the model. We're ready to start running the model. We can then categorize our models basically into two types, a steady state model or a transient model. And the spin up for these two is slightly different. So in the case of a steady state model, we would run the model for a period of time until the flow field has evolved and it's no longer changing. And then we can introduce the effluent and we can see how it moves through the domain and where it goes and how it dilutes. For transient simulation, these are simulations, for example, that would be in tidal estuaries or um, coastal areas where the water, you, you can think of it as sloshing, for example, or, or tides come in and go out. And for that, we have to start the model and let it run for several tidal cycles and let the flow field set up. When the model is first initiated, it is started with basically zero velocities throughout the domain and a flat water body. So you can see it's going to take a little bit of time until it comes up to speed. Um, and then once that happens, we can introduce the effluent and see how it's going to move. The post-processing of the two is also slightly different. In the case of a steady state simulation, um, you can look at the results and see what concentration is of an effluent at any given location. In the case of a transient simulation, the effluent is moving, and so the, the post-processing uh, may actually be statistical in nature. So let's talk just briefly about some of the models that we would use for this. Uh, there is not a single model, in, in our view at least, that can address all of the types of modeling scenarios that you might encounter. So we have a number of them that we use. Some of them are, are like Fluent, for example. Um, these are general purpose, three-dimensional CFD codes. And they work very well for thermal models in river marine environments. Other models are, are Flow 3D, CFX, Star CCM. These are all basically in the same class of CFD models. And there's a number of others that, that I'm not mentioning, um, but that are equally applicable. We can we can move on from there to models that are that are better probably for a large larger domain. Uh, something like Fluent might be good for a model that's less than a mile long, perhaps preferably less than 2,000 feet long. If we have a much larger domain, something we might use is Mike 21, for example, and that's a two-dimensional depth averaged model. So it greatly simplifies the number of equations that are being solved by the model. Uh, it simplifies the meshing as well. So it runs a lot faster, but those simplifications, of course, come at a price. Um, but it allows us to look at much larger scale problems. Um, and we can look at uh, many miles of a river. We've looked um, at, at models with domains in excess of, of 10 to 20 miles using my 21. Now, in some cases, a two-dimensional or depth average model isn't going to be appropriate because you might have stratification. A good example would be a coastal environment where you have a freshwater river coming into salty water, and as a result, you get a saltwater wedge, um, and you need to be able to simulate that in the model. And then you can get into three-dimensional coastal, coastal and estuary models like Mike 3, and again, there's a number of other models that are very similar to it uh, that will allow us to model large domains, reasonably fast, and account for the three-dimensionality of the flow field. So in each case, it's, it's important that we, we look at the domain and then pick the appropriate model. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is, is regulatory acceptance. Um, the analytical and empirical tool acceptance is going to vary significantly with agencies. So that's something that's worth looking into before you start on the modeling endeavor, what that agency is going to want to see in the way of results. Uh, the CFD and hydrodynamic modeling, even though it's, it's more accurate, that does not necessarily mean that it's going to gain agency acceptance. So just because you're doing a more sophisticated and, and more expensive model doesn't guarantee that the agency is going to accept that over a far simpler model. So again, it's, it's very important to check with the agencies and see what, what it's going to require to gain regulatory acceptance. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Hagop and let him finish up on the last slide.
Okay, uh, this is uh, Tony Russo again. Just uh, just a simple wrap up uh, uh, here, and that's that. You know what we've seen today or heard today is that you know achieving regulatory compliance for a major outfall requires obviously a lot of careful planning and study, both the field studies, the the lab modeling, and so forth. And that's true whether it's new construction, you know, major reconstruction of the existing outfall, or even a major process change where there's potential that the effluent quality or quantity is going to change, potentially, and affect uh, receiving water resources. Uh, as we've talked about today, it is very much of uh, an iterative process with each of these steps sort of building on, a, building on another. Overarching all of this, of course, is your desire to ultimately, you know, get a NPDS permit for the facility, but again, you may have cases where to do so means complying with either a federal requirement for an EA or an EIS or state equivalency. Uh, in order to achieve that, you know, oftentimes you'll need a whole host of local permits, state permits, as well as, say, municipal permits. Um, you'll have to undertake your various consistency reviews, both with the resource agencies from, uh, again, as we mentioned before, you know, fisheries, what have you, but also, as you just heard, you know, the need to confirm your modeling approach, the type of modeling you're using, right? And all that, of course, is built upon your field studies, right? How carefully they're planned out, the resources you're looked at, and, uh, and uh, uh, making sure that you've completely, in, at, you know, you've, you've completely uh, characterized the, the uh, receiving water environment. Great, thanks very much. Um, I can uh, follow up here on uh, quickly pointing out our next webinars. Um, and actually, and, and uh, meanwhile, while we're waiting, while I'm doing this, folks, if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them in the Q and A tab at the top of your live meeting interface. Um, anyway, tomorrow we'll be talking about thermal discharge regulations and modeling, and um, It'll uh, be mostly a combination of Alden and ASA talking tomorrow. Then on day three, we will come back to, uh, to Malcolm Perney. First, Mark Kozakowski from, Mark Kozakowski from Alden will be talking about field data collection. And then, uh, Hagop will come back and talk about some case studies, um, a uh, deep ocean outfall, um, and then, uh, the Coney Island outfall repairs and, and the Camp Pendleton desalination plant outfall. Um, the next slide, uh, I've got uh, every all the speakers' email addresses as well as my email address if people have questions that they want to ask privately. Um, otherwise, please go ahead and enter questions in the Q&A tab on your uh, live meeting interface up at the top. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions um, for any of the speakers. Um, as I said, please, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit here so that people can uh, can copy down email addresses and go ahead and, and save those and, and email separate questions. Otherwise, please join us for the additional webinars tomorrow and Thursday. And thank you.